Welcome back to Sci-Fi and Fantasy Read Along. I am ATN. And I am DM Phil. No, I'm DM Phil. And I'm <laughs> Yule. I clearly remember an episode where DM Phil said he was Yule, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't a joke. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Opon was involved on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so it's been a while. I went to Texas. I don't know what you guys did, but um, do you have a clear memory of what we did in our last episode? We talked about the book. You are a ding dong. Uh, at the end of the last chapter... I can't remember. No, I don't. Yeah, I figured that wasn't going anywhere. All right. Uh, so in our last episode, Lorne and Tool had discovered the standing stone that leads to the Jaghut burial spot. Krupp and company had headed for the hills in search of, and Talk had warned Perrin that they were heading into an ambush that would come from a warren. All right. Uh, you guys ready to go? This was... This was a really good. This was a really good um, chapter, in my opinion. Action packed. All right. So the preamble. Did you guys uh, find anything in the preamble that you could pull out of there? It is entitled Jagat, and it is written by Fisher, who was born, but nobody knows when. No, I'm okay with it. I don't think there was anything that special about it. Well, I didn't get anything out of it. This was, again, one of those convoluted poetry things that are difficult to understand. I, the only sense I got out of it was the sense that it's like holding back the tide. That's the only thing that crossed my mind. Okay. Well, let's just jump into the chapter then because I think the preambles, if they don't make sense, it's not a huge big deal. It doesn't really take away from the story. They're just color. They're, they're a little flavor text a lot of times. Yeah. In the same ramshackle hotel adjoining Quip's bar, Quick Ben, now being guarded by Trotz, is observing Hairlock. Yeah, he is. We've met Trotz. He was the guy that was hammering on the road with a pickaxe and, like, didn't give any Fs about anybody passing by. Just going at it, right? He's bargassed, which is not... I read the back of the book. (laughs) I read the glossary. I learned a thing or two. Oh, yeah? What'd you learn about Bargast? They're not human, period. I think we already knew that, but it's a clarifying... They're not just bigger humans. They're not human. Anyway, he is the new guardsman for Quickman. Because Callum got so messed up in the last chapter. Yeah, he had a dagger in his gut. He did. He got... Splat. Got wrenched in there. I doubt it felt good. But anyway, he's still out of commission, so Trotz is taking his place. And Trotz has these fetishes in his hair and these woad tattoos on his body that were put there by a shaman. I don't know what woad is. I assume it's coloration. Uh, Like henna, perhaps? Well, I think it's a little bit more lasting than that, but yes. Well, it is a tattoo, so... It's a blue dye that can be put into a paste and put on your skin, but it'd also be used to inject into the skin, and it's apparently fairly durable. Well, he's covered in these tattoos that were placed by a shaman, and he has these fetishes in his hair, so he is fearless in the face of sorcery, and Quick Ben is glad for that, because what may land in their lap may be rich with sorcery. I had the impression that he was just, like, superstitious when it comes to magic, but Quick Ben was saying those protections could come in handy. So those tattoos and those fetishes may actually have honest protective power. I think they do. I do think they do. And certainly Trotz believes in it. One of Trotz's only actions in this scene is to give a piece of cloth to Quickbin. And it's a piece of cloth from a bedroll. Quickbin comments that he doesn't understand what Hairlock's doing on the Rivy Plain. And I believe he readies a dagger. There's that stick arrangement that's in front of him that we saw again. And we saw it previously in Chapter 8. And it's the stick stabbed into the ground vertically and then there's string that ties them all together and the string is taut so that's pretty much all that we know he's observing hairlock he has a new protector and we're straight up moving on because this chapter goes at a very frenetic pace you guys have anything that you'd like to add to the section no i think that's pretty much uh everything that happened it's pretty uh explainable understandable I thought the whole chapter was really understandable. Like, I didn't have to underline much. I didn't have to, like, think too deeply on much. So, I don't know. 
Maybe that's why Philip didn't like it. Well, I, I felt that a lot of what we read here is a further hammering home and uh, a lot of questioning within the minds of the characters about what's going on. And so there's a lot of like inner reflection, or I should say oh, yeah. reflection, about everything that's going on. And we get Sari does it. Um, obviously, Perrin does it a lot. Yeah. Um, so we, we, I don't know. And then there's a lot of action. And then all of the action kind of builds off of each other. Somebody's observing something that's happening. Somebody gets somewhere after something happened. And that's what this whole chapter is, basically. It might be the whole book. Because if most of the stuff that we're encountering in this chapter was begun in the previous chapter. Back on the Rivy Plain, we've got Talk the Younger and Perrin, and they're riding on horses, and they're heading towards Darujistan. In the last chapter, at the end of Perrin and Talk's section, they Talk's inner sight warned them that they were walking and riding, riding into an ambush, and that ambush would come by Warren. And now we've got them continuing to ride. Perrin is starting to question Talk's premonition, as it were, and having a lot of this inner monologue that Yule was just talking about. Yeah, he uh, he has a lot of... Uh, so there's a, a big, a nice little uh, meaty section where he's basically fantasizing about killing Lorne, which he kind of did in the chapter previous also. Uh, yeah, he's got vengeance on the mind. Which leads him to thinking about Chance and uh, how Opan has been playing a, a, a role in his life. And then he starts to question, you know, uh, Chance's uh, uh, actual worth in the whole scheme of things. Because it's God-touched. And he's like, well, is he really able to do all this that, you know, I think it is <laughs> you know, able to do? I'm going to guess that it's not going to do anything against the Talanamas. Well, that's uh, pretty much what, Yeah. Uh, <laughs> doesn't sound like a lot of things can do a lot to a Talana Moss. That, I mean, There's an interesting sentence in there where Opon's power is put into perspective for us because we had been asking whether or not Opon was an elder god and etc. But according to Perrin in this chapter, in this section, Opon is like a child compared to the Talana Moss. So I think Opon is a child god. Opon cannot access corrupts mind etc i think we've got enough information mm. now that we can definitively state a petulant child the, god yes not and, elder yeah. not God's. elder and not just that i think before we like dramatically overestimated opon's abilities because mm -hmm. he just you're right he does seem to be a, a not an elder deity or a force of nature which is chance but just some relatively recent ascendant there is another yeah spot in this chapter I, I don't it's not here i don't see it at least but um there's another reference to a pawn that is made that said something like despite their power opon blah 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 so i think among the the younger gods opon is quite powerful but i don't think comparable to elder mm -hmm. i agree yeah and that's what kind of resolves it that we yeah whatever we talked about it it's good, though. We, I mean, it's nice to get these things that kind of set my mind at ease. Like, I can now rest assured that this, this deity is not elder, right? I can do that. I can not think of it ever again if I want. Okay, so is there anything important in what Perrin is thinking? Oh, just one tiny comment, and it just, it just struck in my mind, is that Perrin said that he was holding his sword very tightly, and he said it felt like a shard of ice which we have taken to associate with a jagat. And I just thought that was a weird description to the sword. Well, I don't know, but there's going to be another moment where we're going to see ice, so maybe there's a third also. Well, There was ice in the preamble. Yeah, exactly. Um, yep, all right, yep. well, if I can't find a third in the middle of the or in this chapter, that will be the third one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it means anything, but it just seems weird that that's how he describes it. He said it felt awkward in his hand, like he was a novice with the weapon. He described it many different ways, and all of those ways suggest to me that it's not really a comfortable fit right now. Can't rely on it. Doesn't That's what it feels like to me. And then right after thinking all this, uh, he, he thinks to, he continues, what had, what had triggered this sudden crumpling of confidence? And I was wondering if there was like some reason for that other than, you know, just you know, thinking about everything as it's going along. Was there something that did this to him? 
I suspect yes. Was it but I Tattersail also sus- dying? You know? No, I don't think so. But I, I don't think it's really fair to, to answer your question right this minute okay. because I think we get an answer to it in a couple of sections. Yeah. Um, well, and I think they kind of, we, we, I think it was the last chapter we talked about whether or not Perrin was in full control of his actions. And I felt kind of stupid thinking that, you know, he was in control of what he was doing, that he was tortured by, you know, Tattersail being dead and blind with fury and all that other stuff. But you guys kind of is this your vindication? Because it sounds to me like it's not a vindication. It sounds like the opposite of a vindication. No, 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 not not this part. But when we get to that next part, I I want to talk about it again. Yes. Okay. Obviously, yes. When we when we bring it up, um, I I thought of something when I was on my long drive, and it had to do with the fact that Perrin was improperly healed, which is going to come up Mm -hmm. in this section uh, soon. It's going to come up again soon. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that in the moment. I suppose that would make more sense. Yeah. Well, he's just about to say something to talk. So like it's as all this thought is coming to him, he is questioning himself. He's questioning his sword. He's thinking about killing Lauren, all that stuff. And then he's finally going to say something to talk because it's been a silent ride for a while. And he, just as he's about to speak, there's a cackling of laughter and it's hairlock. I love Paralyzed. And he's so like much. floating in the air like 20 feet farther from them or something like that. Well, he's real short, you know, he wouldn't be able to see over the grass. Sure. Uh, and he's like, he's uh, he's using magic uh, to like attack the horses. He, well, he kills Perrin's horse straight away. Yeah. He said it felt like the bones just disintegrated inside the horse. And he lands on the ground, loses his sword, and the horse rolls over on his legs. And the only problem I had with this entire chapter was the fact that he used his legs to push the horse off of him. Yeah, but I mean, if if his uh, if those bones are dusted inside, uh-uh. how much does a horse weigh? <laughs> well, I don't know, but I mean, I would assume and it's the on your muscle legs. and the and the, all the other stuff no. probably got disintegrated too in there. Well, no, let's, it doesn't matter. Let's well, just well, landed yeah, on his it's legs. Just skin. What is it? Twenty pounds of skin. No, it's like 800 pounds, approximately. What? What? <laughs> it landed on his just legs. just the skin itself of a horse only weighs, is, is weighs 800 pounds? It didn't say anything. You're, you're incorrect if there, If you pulverize sir. bone, you probably did mush, muscle and tissue also. It doesn't disintegrate it. It well, just turned he, into like... It does say that it sounded like a bag of oil and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's a description for its landing, and it... Right. It didn't land like a wisp of wind or a piece of paper. It landed like something heavy on his legs. I hear you. Well, okay. Well, just so you know, yeah. At, at a minimum, a horse is eight hundred pounds, but they can be up to two thousand pounds. Mm-hmm. So that, I'm just saying, it's a lot of weight, especially if it's there's no bones in it. And it's on his legs, and he used his legs to push it off. Like, I mean, I I was bothered by that. Yeah, it's like pushing off a bean bag that weighs you know a ton. <laughs> We should make one. Mm. All right. So uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so talk is firing arrows that are shattering. Twice. Bam, bam. They're, just, they're hitting their mark, but they shatter before it really does any damage or anything. I mean, Something I don't like think that. they can damage yeah. Hairlock. No, I, I don't think, th- the, I don't think so. There. But I mean, how good of a marksman do you have to be to hit just like a, a, a little? He's a little puppet. A floating marionette in the air. Seriously. It's, it, talk's really good, man. He's really good with that bow. One eye. He hit the mark twice, no have, problem. He, he, you would think that guy would have depth perception problems, but he, no problem at all. Yes, man. seriously. He only has one eye, and he just, like, nailed him twice. He well. also has inner sight, <laughs> don't forget. So, um, unfortunately, this is the last time Talk does anything. A rent is uh, opened up in the sky, and Talk is thrown into it, and, it, and he disappears. Hairlock did that super, super well. I mean, it's like talking about somebody adept with magic right Mm -hmm. because he just flung talk off of his horse and cartwheeled him through the air (laughs) then opened up a a warren behind him let him go through it and then closed it yeah that was awesome majory i'll I'll agree with that in i mean just like getting rid of an enemy just poof poof gone gone. instantly amazing super amazing and herlock uses what was it chaos magic he's dabbling in he's using it but that's not where he sent uh, talk. Oh, okay. He said it was a Misty Warren or something like that. Okay. So it's not the same as the Warren that he goes into later that Perrin described as having a fetid stench. All right. Two different two different places. 
Oh, okay, I got you, sure. But yes, Hairlock is using Chaos, which is probably what he used to kill the horse, right? So now it's just Perrin and Hairlock, and they're facing yeah, off. Yeah, but Perrin was able to push that horse off of his legs miraculously. I'm okay with it. I, I grab his sword and then stand up. Maybe just the neck fell on him, and it wasn't that big a deal, you know? I mean, it was mm-hmm. enough to take him down and have to scramble, but not enough to where... Look, if the, I mean, obviously, if a horse lands on you, you're going to break your leg, you know, or something. Hey, remember, this is a 2,000-pound beanbag. Well, it, it, yeah, I mean, I'm going to give this one. I mean, this is like a superhero situation, you know. Uh, your hero has to get up and be able to take on the other situation. And what's more important, a dead horse that rolled over on you or the magic guy that's shooting you down? I mean, I just I just choose not to have the horse roll over on you and solve it that way. Mm. You know, he's going to fall down when the horse dies. He's going to fall down. He's not going to keep his footing. I hear you. So uh, there's no problem there. It's a choice he made. I don't like his choice. It's not a big deal, though. I'm prepared to move on. A parent has chance in his hand, and Harlech's like, that sword ain't going to do anything to me. <laughs> he said it wasn't made for him. Yeah, he does. He says it wasn't made for him. Yeah. And uh, and he's like, it won't even I cut think, me. It won't even cut I me. I think Tox's arrows are exactly the same. The, incapable of harming Hairlock. Yeah, and Perrin's like, oh, well, I'll try and chop you up to kindling anyway. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. right as they're about to face off, Hairlock turns and hears the distant howl of hounds. We were questioning a couple of chapters ago whether or not Hairlock had ever threatened Perrin's life. And we were like, nah, he didn't do it. It's impossible. Tattersail couldn't have heard it, blah, blah, blah. He seems like it's the kind of thing that he would say, though. But wait a in second. In this section. But, but what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean? Uh, explain. I mean, he is menacing Perrin, saying that he wants to prolong his death as long as possible, make it painful, hurt him until... He just gets bored with hurting him. Well, I don't get like this is one of the reasons I did not like remember. This he's insane. He's completely yeah. Nuts, but he dude. he talked about killing Perrin when he was holed up in Tattersail's place, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we had determined that that could have been a lie from Tattersail to manipulate Perrin because there was no time when she would have been able to talk to Hairlock. He, she was unconscious the entire time Perrin had been in the picture. But I was right? thinking that was Perrin saying that all he would... I can't remember anymore, but I'm going back to it anyway. Well, go back to it by reading it and getting it correctly. Okay, yeah. well, fine. But yeah, but my... But you well, maybe it wasn't a lie then. How do you like that? I mean, he is menacing him. He is a dick to him. He is. What, Philip? You asked me why I didn't like this chapter, and this is one of those examples of I I just I don't comprehend why the the magnitude of malevolence and hatred towards Perrin by Hairlock. I mean, ultimately, Perrin has never done anything to Hairlock. It has to be. I agree with you. Like I remember feeling that it was very out of place for that to have been said by Tattersail, but in this instant, when it's coming out of Hairlock's mouth, I can't help but believe her statement from earlier. And the only thing I can think of was that Perrin got in the way of what Hairlock was trying to do to the to the dog, to the hound. But was there a moment where Perrin was want, uh, standing guard for Tattersail? Yeah, after she was unconscious, right. after and the whole thing with the dog. That's the part I think I remember him saying that Hairlock would go and do what he does, and he came back and he'd always like, I'm going to kill you or something like that. Because he wouldn't let Hairlock get close to Tattersail. I know what you're thinking about. It's the That's conversation that it's the conversation that Quick Ben had with Hairlock when Hairlock didn't realize he was uh, speaking out loud. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, even so per- e- even Perrin wouldn't know. <sighs> no, well, but e- if he does, if ta- I'm sorry, Philip, if Tatters or if uh, Hairlock talks out li- loud like that, I mean, there's a very good chance he probably did that in Perrin's presence. Also, that's a good point. That's a good point. Okay, I'll take it. I'll accept that. I, I, I'm sorry, Philip. I cut you off. No, that's all right. You all, that's all right. I do, I, I'm sure I do that all the time when I get excited, you know, and I'm like, I'm about to, I have something I want to say right now. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, I just this is one scene. I the, the, this this storyline right here, I, I just didn't like it. I, the 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 focused hatred towards Perrin just they barely knew each other. He didn't really interfere with them, and I don't really understand why he hated Tattersail either. 
It, it, well, it, other than he's insane, a puppet. Well, okay, I dabbling agree. in magic that's even making him more insane, probably. I agree with that, but if you want to go back in, I don't know his entire life history here, but if that this guy has to have so many more serious enemies than Perrin and Tattersall in his life, uh, Tayshin for one, right? Why not go after Definitely. Tayshin? Definitely. Oh, I suspect he's going after Tayshin. And, I know, think everybody's just, game when it comes to Harlock. <laughs> this dude, Perrin, is just a roadblock on the path to Tayshin right now. That might be right? true, but it's just a lot of effort for just like a nil, negligible, uh, negligible amount of gain. Mm, he's it's worth it to him, obviously, but he's crazy, so I'm I'm also okay with all right, that. All right, all right. I'm sorry that you didn't like it, um, but it didn't bother me. All right, fair enough. We, we we can agree. I was just, when these things come up, I will state my case. Yep, yep. Yeah, you bring them up each in turn, and then we'll do them all at the end, right? I'm compiling a summary as we speak. Yeah, that's fine. But we'll save it to the end. Oh, just before we go on to the next part, uh, that part with Chance, where they're talking about it, that was yet yep. another time we're, we're led to question Chance's viability, you know, how it's supposed to work. Like, this sword can't cut me. Don't worry about it, you know. Yes. So, We're le- oh, you're talking about like instilling doubt in us about the swords. That's efficacy? what I'm saying. Yes, exactly. Yes, because he does spend this entire chapter building that notion in our minds. Sure thing. Having watched Harlock ambush Perrin and talk, Quickbin summons the rope's attention with a scrap of cloth from Sari's bedroll. Quickbin didn't even know that he was like, "Where's Tattersail? What's Perrin doing here?" <laughs> Who's that guy with Perrin? Where's Tattersail? Yeah, he got out of control really fast. Yeah, but the minute he sees Harlock, he's like, hey, sorry. And he's like talking yeah. telepathically, I guess. He didn't summon sorry physically, and he didn't refer to her as sorry, and the person that answered was not a woman. He summoned the rope. Quickbin's like, Cotillion, patron of assassins, the rope, I call upon you. And the premise is, is that he's going to use the rope to talk to Shadow Throne to send the hounds exactly where they're supposed to be because that's the deal they made. And the rope acknowledges the deal, says it's very smart. Quickbin has outsmarted Shadow Throne, and he tipped his hat to him. I actually did. I thought this part was like really, really cool how he set it all up. So, yeah, I, I, I do really like this part. Very cool. Now, I do have a question. Is the rope willing... To do what Quick Ben wants because of Sari's involvement in the whole thing? Like, I didn't see any reason why the rope needed to do what Quick Ben wanted of him. Because Shadow Throne wanted that information. Like, it was a deal that they had made, and he was part of it. Right. I mean, I, that's that's all I needed to know from that. Like, I was happy with that explanation. Okay, so well, it wasn't anything deeper than that. No, I th- I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. I think it was literally a bit uh Quickbin's plan was just to use uh sorry slash the rope to ferry a message to Shadow Throne and thus leaving Quickbin without a direct line of communi- contact and communication. It was one I uh, sorry, it was one degree of Kevin Bacon away from Shadow Throne. Yeah, so Shadow Throne can't actually reach to him and kill him. Exactly. Or I guess it would be two degrees, right? So Quickbin somehow mentally transmits the exact location of Harlock on the Rivi plane to the rope, who immediately transfers that knowledge to Shadow Throne. And the hounds are already ready. They've been ready for uh, at least a day or two. <laughs> As we know, um, Harlock's already heard them approaching. So now the only thing left to do is to prevent Harlock from escaping. Yeah, and, and Quick Ben is gleeful with this idea. All right, are you guys ready to move on? Um, oh, no, so that I had this, like, this feeling that maybe Talk the Younger, was, like, alive and could survive, but pretty much Quick Ben said he was done, he was dead. I'm actually really bummed, and it seemed to happen too fast, so... He couldn't do anything about well, it. Well, he says to prevent the loss of the one-eyed man. He's gone. That just means loss. He's lost. He's off the battlefield. It doesn't necessarily mean that this person's dead, you know? Well, he also said that he thought Perrin was essentially dead. I think that was in this section. He's like, oh, it's too bad. I wanted to ask him questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah, He's already written off Perrin, too. Tool 
has been squatting before the 10 inches of standing stone since before dawn and Lauren has wandered off into the hills out of boredom and she is having an internal monologue just like Perrin was and she's feeling very conflicted knows certainly that what she's doing is not the right course of act like it's a bad move she's she's making a bad move in the name of the empire yeah she's like walking away from tool and it's like not it was like an hour the last time she looked at him and he hadn't even moved yeah, I think she's bored, man. And it says, Malaz killed its own. Humanity had not climbed up since the dark age of the Amos. And I think that's yeah. pretty much what yeah you know, she's thinking about. Yeah, well, she also made a comparison between the two races. The Talon Amos had been on a genocidal war against another species, but the Malazans are killing other humans. And she's, she thinks that's a, a step down, step backwards. And yeah, it's it's true though. It's absolutely true. But we don't know why the Talana Moss were killing the Jagat. Jagat didn't seem like a threat to me. The way they've been described so far seems like they were kind of just loners that, you know, every now and then had a tyrant. Yeah, pacifistic and isolationist <laughs> is kind of how I describe them. Do we constantly have a tyrant, Yule? Humans constantly have a tyrant. I, Numerous tyrants. Yeah, but I mean, come on. You have to work hard to be that. Occasionally the Jagat did. Yeah, but when a jagged does it, it sounds like it's bad for a whole lot more people. I guess, man. I don't know. <laughs> you got to chain these efforts up. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, they could, what, destroy and enslave an entire continent? That's scary. It is scary. I mean, it's and like, you know what it makes yeah, go ahead. me think about? It makes me think of the Black Company and the Dominator. Sure. Going back to the Black Company. Lauren's board she's walking around tool hasn't moved she's just kind of exploring on her own and she crests a hill and there are four people three of whom are on donkeys and one is on a horse and she's like they're both surprised both groups are surprised but she's like uh uh-uh. uh and she just straight up pulls her sword and attacks yeah she she's like they're like 30 almost 30 feet away and she just like that's only 10 meters man that's super close yeah she's like a running back man she can get there quick she did too. And she has and Cole, this sword. <laughs> Cole really surprised me. He was, I thought, in the back of the group, and he like immediately reacted and was able to get up in the front of the group. He like has um, improved initiative, right? Sure. Apparently, so, so he goes first. Essentially, he beats the he beats everybody to the contact. But Lauren actually got a higher initiative, so she got to slice and dice him when it came right down to it. Well, his first uh, his first action was a move action. Ah, uh, yes, and then Lauren didn't have to move. Or no, she. What's the what's the feat where you get to move and then attack and then move? Oh, the spring attack. Yes, Lauren has spring attack. That's what it is. <laughs> is she a monk? She has, no, she's a ro- she's well in D and D she'd be a rogue. Nah, she was holding action, and then when he charged, man, it's just like boom. no, she charged. She charged first. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. And nobody gets a surprise round because they were both surprised. Well, the first wait, but the first thing she does is she she knocks. Uh, uh, Krupp off his horse, right? He does that to himself. I mean, uh, her auditorial <laughs> sword. That is a passive action, man. She didn't have to. That was a free action. She didn't have to do anything. I slightly had the impression that I mean, he tried to cast a spell and it kind of like boomeranged mentally and hit him back and knocked him off the back of his horse. I don't know. Right over the ass's ass is where he went. <laughs> yeah, and, and he's just out cold. Yeah, he's out he's cold just... immediately. And then Crocus is like. He pulls out his dagger and he's like, I think I'll go over here instead. <laughs> I think he thought Cole had it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, and Marilio was already dismounting and pulling his blade and, you know, following behind Cole and, and he went to go help Krupp. But um, Cole got owned here. Yeah, Cole got sliced in the leg, an arterial cut, and it's just blood going everywhere. Yeah. And Marilio uh, Marilio actually lands a blow on her, but she just knocks him out cold with the flat of her blade. Right, Bam. exactly. Instantaneous, which leaves only Crocus on his feet, and um, he like runs away. Right. Well, no, he really does not run away. He says, "Why did you attack us? Right, like, why? What? Why? You don't have to kill me. We can just go our own ways. We'll leave." And she's like, "All right." Yeah, you see, I mean, this whole scene, I just it just did not sit well with me. It just didn't make any sense. Why just, like, 
oh, you come over a hill and you see somebody, oh, I'll kill them all. You know, that makes no sense whatsoever. And then like, oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I changed my mind. I'm not going to kill you all. Yeah, just go ahead and leave when you get the chance. I mean, well, that, kind of like what ATN said. She was bored. She's probably jumpy. She knows stuff's going on, right? Even so, I mean, it's not like it's it's not like something is flying at you and you duck to react. I mean, she had a, many seconds to evaluate, analyze, decide, and and execute. Well, it's a strange reaction since she was having inner monologue that would suggest she does. You know, humans are horrible, killing each other all the time. And that's the first thing she went right back to, was to attack these people and take them out. So I had a thought that this whole scene, let us I want to be really, really clear real quick, though. Um, nobody's dead, right? Correct. Everybody's alive, but there's been this bloody confrontation and Lauren is the victor. When I was thinking about this from terms of good luck and bad luck, and like this is the coin bearer who's got good luck on his side. His entire party just had the worst luck when encountering Lauren, right? And then she decimates the party. And that's terrible luck, right? Yes. But then she spares all of their lives, which is great. That's good luck. So I'm wondering if this isn't something to do with Opon, because you remember that Lauren was aware that she had been being manipulated by Opon in the last chapter and was like, that felt weird. And then at the end of the chapter, she was like, I know that this particular thing that we're now talking about is not Opon. So I'm also wondering if that had something to do with it. Maybe. I don't know. It, there's no explanation there. It just... To me, it just didn't make any sense. And then, like, either way, attacking did not make sense. Leaving them alive did not make sense. None of it made sense. So I did not like this scene at all. At this, well, maybe there's a greater point here. But and if Opan is the reason, maybe that is a good reason. But it seems even Opan was it seemed conflicting. Why did it favor uh, Lorn and then suddenly switch and then favor Krupp's party? She does say something after it's all said and done. She says she need not have attacked and she did not like to spill blood. Clearly she did. Again, another thing that's strange. She, Then why did you do this? <laughs> I mean, when I get com conflicts like this in characters and it's very, very obvious to me that it's it's being made obvious, right? It's like when when old um, Ralik Nam was told by Ocelot to go and be obvious, and he's like, I can't make it too obvious. It'll be obvious. Well, I think that's what's going on for me here, is that Erickson is making it obvious that this is strange and kind of at odds. Well, the We're getting two different ideas about her in the same section. So to me, that says, hmm, not natural. It's like a fighting pacifist. Maybe your tenants are wanting to uh, adhere to pacifism, but you're always in situations where you got to duke it out. I don't it would know be if really that nice applies. to not be in this situation ever again. And humans are scum, but well, let's she's going to do her job anyway. <laughs> well, well, maybe, well, but I mean, like if Opon is influencing Lorne and if, obviously Crocus and, if, and, and Cro party, if, yeah, yes, if that's for, yeah, exactly if. Right, and then and then um, Crocus is kind of the the coin bearer. I, just, I, I don't I don't see kinda. Well, he is the coin bearer. Kinda. He possesses the coin. <laughs> All right. Well, so I, I don't get why Opon would be fighting against itself, but maybe that makes perfect sense because there's a they're, they're twins, right? I don't know that you have to even be fighting against yourself. I mean, I think you, we can just see both sides of the coin in the same scene, right? There's some bad luck followed by some good luck. Well, I just think Opon has an agenda, and they and the twins wouldn't, wouldn't... What do you think it is, then? I don't know. It made no sense to me. That's what I'm getting. I thought everything I could possibly think of, like one thing, and it didn't work. If anybody can... No. Nope. Put, put, no. put me on the no. path. No. <laughs> Let us know because... in the comments down below. No. Nope. No, do not let us know in the comments down below because it's basically taking stuff from the future that I don't want at this point. Ah, do you know what this means? No, but if somebody does, I don't want it spoiled. It doesn't oh, I mean don't know. they know. It means they think also. We're reading yeah. along, of course. Yes. 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 Well, some of the people who have left comments are spoiling future yeah, sections. Yeah, that's not cool. This is a discussion, not a revelation. Yeah, try and keep it pertinent to what we're talking about right this moment if you can. I understand that it's tough. You make it make it good for the other people. No spoilers. Just don't read the comments. I mean, that's the easiest thing. That's really what ignore. it is. Don't read the comments. Ignore so let us know comments. in the comments down below, actually. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Just exactly. don't let me We're know about book you. two. 
<laughs> hmm. Well, no matter how we take this section, Lorne leaves that engagement the clear victor there, and she starts heading off in a direction that's not back towards Tool. She's convinced that this party from Darugistan has nothing to do with her. <laughs> Which, do you think that's a fair assessment to make? I would always err on the side of caution and say, I wonder if these people are here for me. Exactly. Right? Kill them. Right. I think she did the right thing in attacking them, but then, like staying her hand at the end and not killing them all that had to be somebody else that had to be some influence i know well see that's what i mean is like lead with diplomacy i'm like why are you here that would have been smart but she didn't go with that route yeah. so we have and to if, assume if there was a reason that's right but if she intuits they're there for another reason then you kill them because your mission is of top priority and then that's what I mean. There's a paradox there. It's just like the aggression was there in the beginning and it did make sense. And then the forgiveness was there in the end. And that made well, no the sense. The problem is that she doesn't agree with her ultimate mission also now. She is conflicted. That's true. And I mean, she is walking away from where she's supposed to be. I mean, she That's a pretty literal reading. I mean, do you think she's actually walking away? I don't know. I think she's dwelling on it hard. I, I think she's... She wants to be loyal, and I think she wants to maintain her duty, sense of duty. But I obviously she's conflicted. I mean, she literally said, I know this is wrong. Yeah, the person that's giving her orders is the person that's actually in the wrong. She is trying to come up with the inner strength to counteract those orders, right? Or to reaffirm her convictions to execute her duty. Hmm. One or the other, she's conflicted. It's the theme of this chapter. Having relayed the message, Sari resumes her journey. And as we recall, Sari's on the plane. She's been following that party of people, Krupp and company, from Darujistan. She's traveling by Warren, and it's getting difficult, just like it did with Tattersail. So she's getting out of her Warren. She knows that it's a Talana Moss causing the problem, and she starts going at it on foot. Well, I thought that was cool that even a god is significantly curtailed by the power of a Talani Mas. That is incredible. Remember the hierarchy, though. They're elder. Yeah. So what is the, the Talani Mas doing to make this happen again? I don't know if it's a passive effect. He said that he had done it, I think. But it must be a known thing that Talani Mas can do. He's creating a dead magic zone. I don't know if it works, but it seems like it does, right? It's it seems like good. it's noticeable, and it's making the travel from Warren difficult. I, was it keeping Harlock away? I think it will. It was not. It was not. No, it was not. He was acting inside of the. He was acting inside of it, and that's why Tool was so upset because the Warren was being opened inside of his zone. Oh, that's right. And Tool said and, that something's going on. He doesn't understand it. Well, and the ravens were flying at night. Yeah, it was. Well, is that because chaos itself is it Elder Warren? It's Eld Elderer. Mm, okay. He, I think he described it as the first Warren or the, the eldest of all Warrens. Like Starveld. The, Carol, or Starveld. Carold? Starveld Demolane, I think, is the one he referred to as the eldest of them all. It's Star, and then, um, oh, God. What's the other one? Galane? Carold. Carold Galane is um, Darkness. Gotcha. Which we'll see more of later. Yes. Yeah. I'm still figuring this stuff out. I know. Because it's a mess. It is a mess. It's a mess. It is. I mean, well, it's because we know to think about it. Whereas when we first read this, we were like, what the hell am I reading? <laughs> it was like Latin. I just kind of threw the words away because it, I was like, that's something like that. I would have never I finished it, it otherwise. You know, if yeah, I, exactly. if I, and that's the reason why I didn't in the beginning. You know, yeah. just 50 pages in, yeah. and you're like, what the hell am I reading? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But now, right, so I mean, it's amazing that this is all just over a course of a couple days. The chapters are actually very well thought out and put together. And it's actually kind of simple, you know, us talking about it like this. There's just like little moments I'm now forgetting instead of entire passages. Well, it, it, yeah. yeah, it is a slight aside. I mean, think about it. Like, how can you write like several hundred pages that really only take place over a couple of days? That is amazing. Yeah, I think it's a hell of a spreadsheet or a hell of a flow chart. Right. Is really what it is. And then a lot of revision. God, it's incredible. Probably yeah. a good yeah, editor. Well, 
Well, yeah. Well, well. again, kudos to Steven Erickson because I was thinking about that. So far, this entire book really takes place over like the span of a week or something. Yeah, a couple, I think. But not many. Like Pale, like from, from the time that the day before Pale fell or whatever, the day Pale fell, that's the beginning of the book, right? Yeah. Well, chapter one was two years before that. Well, but that's true, but I mean, that's a slight diversion. Pale fell, and then a couple of days later, there were people leaving for Darujistan. And everything that's happened in Jerusalem has taken less than a week. Crazy. I mean, I honestly don't know how you write this much, like, condensed book over so short of a, you know, timeline. All right. So we have <laughs> Sari back on the plane, and she is observing the, the party, Krupp and company, climb this hill. And she's following, and then she hears a skirmish. And she gets to a high vantage point, and she watches Lorne decimate these people. And then she watches as Lorne kind of just backs away to the north. And then she pulls out a garrote, and she starts creeping closer. She's like, I got a mission to do. She thinks to herself that soon she will have the coin, and that maybe a god will die today. All right, so this next section that we're heading into is extremely detailed and long and I'm just going to hit it one piece at a time until we're all the way through it um, just to make it manageable another thing that we're gonna do for this section is that little snippet with quick Ben we're just gonna roll through the section with it okay we're not gonna pull it out and separate it that would be silly because it happens instantaneously right then we're just gonna talk about it in the order that this appeared and pretend like it's just one long section Unwilling to face the hounds, Hairlock issues more threats to Perrin and then scurries for his warren. Yeah, how does he how does he run away leaving hounds to eat up Perrin and then still threaten him at the same time? I mean, he well, has to know what's going to happen if he ditches this guy. No. He doesn't care what happens. But to at him. the same time he's still But I'll get you. <laughs> One of these days. Yeah, well, no, there, you... there's not going to be any Perrin left. Yeah, Yule is mm. right. That didn't make any sense. He's like, oh, I'll come back later for you. But he's got to know that the hounds are going to kill him. All right, irrational insanity. Got it. <laughs> remember how weird Hairlock has been? Like, remember that he didn't know that Opon was a player in the game, and yet he was saying Opon's name. He was saying that there was a magic sword involved. Like, when he was talking to Quickman and the Spar of Andy, like... He was obviously not making any sense. He was not picking up the clues. So I think it's fair to say that he's a nut. He's kooks. We know he, we know he is. That's, you're right. Bonkers. As this section ends, Hairlock is jumping into a portal. Well, he's trying to. He's heading for the, he's heading for the Warren, right? right? He's heading for the Warren. It's like, I'll get you. And Quick Ben is watching remotely as we had already seen at the beginning of the chapter. And that is when he pulls his dagger, cuts the thread on those sticks that were held together with twine. And that's all we get, except that I think Quick Ben is kind of giggling or smiling to himself about that whole thing. Oh, he's happy. So Perrin observes Hairlock turning to run for his Warren and then just falls flat on his belly. And Perrin's like, huh? And he's just leaning on his sword and watching. Uh, but his hairlock asks for help. He's like, let me help. <laughs> your life help me. is yours. Help me. Just throw me through the war. And Perrin just kind of leans on his sword huh. as the hounds pass him. I mean, like, seriously, I mean, that was, I don't know. I like the scene so much. It's just so perfect. I mean, like, really? Would Perrin like, oh, yeah, sure. Let me help you out there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, after all the threats and indignities? Yeah. No way. The, the promises of torture and like, no, why would I help you, dummy? You're not getting any help. So the dogs who arrive, I believe it's all of, all them, of them. And a couple of them are making eyes at Perrin. Well, and Gear one does. in particular. Yeah. yeah. Because Perrin it's, sliced up Gear with chance. I think he saved his life personally because Hairlock was just about to steal his soul that may be true doesn't matter seriously they should be thankful in fact gear owes him one but that's not how they see it no without the simple minds perhaps it might that might just be like animals you know he knows the thing that hurt him and that's what he knows you know um he did get stabbed pretty badly so um they finish Hairlock 
I think three of them are like fighting over the remnants of the twigs and the sticks that he was made of. And then four of them, including gear, turn to face Perrin with gear in the center. And it's like, what are these guys going to do? You don't need to guess. They, I mean, gear wants to eat Perrin. Yeah, That's Perrin's all. dead. And Perrin's pretty much resigned. He's like, eh. I'm going to, I'm going to do some damage. And if this yeah, is what's going to come, blood, boys. it's what's going to come. Yeah. Yep. At least he knows his sword hurts them. Doing back a little bit, so, like, normal weapons don't hurt uh, Hairlock. Um, Hairlock did not think Perrin's sword would hurt him, yet the dogs just rip him apart. So I'm I'm a little confused there. Are they, like, norm- normal teeth or magic teeth or god teeth? I mean, I mean, yes, they are god teeth. That makes sense, don't you think? Yeah, something. Elder teeth, at least? Cause I- Certainly able to crunch right through him. I mean, we've seen a lot of evidence that suggests that there is a power hierarchy, and these dogs were described by Tattersail very early on as ancient, like beyond reckoning ancient. Yes. And Hairlock was a man very recently, so he's not he on the hierarchy. He's low. Got it. Okay, yeah, that's something I was thinking of. Like, uh, these, these hounds are... In the hierarchy, as you said, are are they're ancient and whatever powers Herlock has is nothing. They have god teeth. Yep, god teeth. Got it. Well, they crunched him and they turned on Perrin, and that is when we get us we get a description of a thing like extra gravity and heaviness and Perrin and the grass around him is getting crushed, pushed down, and we saw this at Baruch's place, and bam, there's Anamander Rake. He pushes past him, and he's like, get out of the way, mortal. <laughs> well, he, he does. He says, step aside. Yeah, and I really like the repartee between Perrin and Rake. It's very... Well, what did you do to attract the attention of God? Exactly. It's a bad idea. Yeah, it, this is very much like when we were seeing Quick Ben and Kalam, and we've also seen Perrin and Talk have some really nice conversations with each other. It, you get good conversation with a, a lot of the characters, and they have, they have real emotions. <laughs> <laughs> um, it feels it feels like a natural conversation mm-hmm. to me, and I would like to point out that when Anamander Rake answers questions, it is a powerful person answering questions. Mm-hmm. Like just look at his answers to every question or his refusal to answer, and it's like, man, it makes so much sense. Like you really get a sense of what this guy is like when he talks. Right. Like, In response to that statement about you know Perrin attracting the attention of gods i seem like i never learn and then anna mandarake says we're both alike mortal remember that conversation that kelly and brood had with calor when calor was just went off and like i have done all these things and i have conquered all this and blah 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 and he's like do you understand what i'm saying and kelly and brood said yeah you never learn <laughs> that was the preamble in front of one of the chapters mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, it, but that means that Anamander Rake is aware of the fact that he is acting in a way that attracts the attention of deities, but he does it anyway, whereas Kallur never learns. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. It's It might be a struggle. So is one, <laughs> is Anamander Rake, is, is he doing that because he knows his place and Kallur doesn't know his place? Or is Anamander Rake just like Kallur also? Yeah, we don't know. We can't actually answer that. We can answer it for Anamander. We cannot answer it for Kalor. We don't really know Kalor yet. Mm-hmm. Anamander is obviously very confident. So Rake arrives and warns Rude and the Hounds to get out of there. That their their presence is not welcome, and they need to withdraw from the field of battle essentially. And then he has this conversation with Perrin, and is like. Oh, well, they want to kill me really badly, but they dare not. He says, and what are their chances? And no. Rake says, well, the <laughs> fact that they're hesitating should let you know what they think their chances are. But that is when they attack. Everything goes really crazy with Perrin. It, it is instantaneous. It says an invisible fist of darkness exploded behind his eyes. A snapping of massive chains. The groan of huge wooden wheels. There's a little bit more, but when he wait, you know, when he comes out of that, the battle's over, and two hounds are killed. You know, I thought that was so artfully done as a writer. Oh yes, that was so yes. artfully done because it's just like you know stuff's about to happen, and then you black out for just a second, and then you come back and it's over. And I'm like, oh my god, that was so good. And we're hearing Dragnapur. 
all of Dragnapur's everything is like assaulting Perrin, and he's not even the one being attacked. Okay, so a couple of things. Rake did not have his sword in his hand when the dogs attacked. I noticed okay? that, yeah. He, he, had, he did not, he didn't ever even made a move to draw it. He was just standing in front of those dogs like they were no threat whatsoever. Yep. He turned, he turned away and was talking to Perrin, and then they attacked, so they had an advantage there as well. But then, like, a second later, two of those dogs are dead, and the sword is in his hand. And I was wondering, like, is it just the act of drawing the sword? Is it the sword taking souls that had that effect on Perrin? Like, I don't know what it was, but, like, it was powerful. And then I was reminded that Baruch had a spell with that sword as well, just looking at it. Yeah. So I don't I don't really know, but um, I don't know. He has quick draw or something, but... Definitely. Definitely quick draw. But, I, you know, and this It's a big scene, sword, too. Yeah, he has minuses on that roll. Ser- no. Seriously, the scene was so awesome because, like, you you are surrounded by like these hounds that are like so ancient, and they're they they, they like wiped out like what are like over a thousand troops, like in the, right? Yeah, back in uh, Itko Khan, yeah. but Animator Rake just like stops to have this casual conversation. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and kills two of those dogs. I mean, one of them was nearly decapitated, and the other one had a chest wound across the flesh. It shouldn't right? have been a killing wound, it sounds like. But it did. But it Do did. Job. I love this part. Hold on. Uh, Perrin says, you just killed two hounds of shadow. And Animator Rake says, the others withdrew. <laughs> that is what I'm talking about. Yeah. When I say that he, he answers questions powerfully... <laughs> If they didn't withdraw, they'd be dead too. Yeah. <laughs> it says a lot more than just a few words that he used, right? Oh. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's like, oh, so well. good. So this is when Shadow Throne arrives. Like the shadows appear and then there's Shadow Throne, who's described again as kind of an amorphous shape of Shadow. And um, Anamander Rake has a little conversation with him. Says, get out of here. You're not welcome here anymore. I don't want you on the field of battle. Withdraw your influence. And uh, Shadow Throne says, uh, "This was the hunt I was after. I'm no longer involved." No, he said he. But the, he's, but the rope is. No, he said he was not involved at all. Oh no! no okay, sorry, you get you're saying he was not involved with what's going on here. He was specifically going after Harlock, and even though he didn't specify him, he's like, "No, I was here. To, my hunt is over. I accomplished my mission. I'm not here to do anything else." But then there's the rope. The fa- the matter of the rope is really the situation here now. Yeah, because he kind of brings right. it up. He's like. He's like, oh, by the way, Rake, there's also the rope, and I can't quite vouch for what this guy's going to do. Well, he, he does not like that at all. He says that if there's any any question about anybody's activities, his, the dogs, or the ropes, that he was going to assail the Shadow Realm itself. And he, and he well, he was, we're welcome to try to stop him. And he demands that the rope, or, or is that later? No, it says it right there. And yeah, he said it so well. He's like, I don't care if it's the hounds or the rope or you. I make no distinction. I'm holding you responsible is what he essentially said. It was, oh, I love that scene. But no. the other part was he said, I have no patience for your games. And then Shadow Throne responded like, you lack all subtlety. I was thinking about that. And like we're talking about like, Animator Rake speaks so powerfully. It's like he doesn't play games. He's so confident in his power that... He's just direct and blunt, mm-hmm. and oh, I like. I don't know. I like that interchange. Atn, you are correct. That's Rake says that with the dogs and Shadow Throne, especially if the rope was around, they might actually pose a threat to him. But it would be costly, and he would be avenged. But he just doesn't seem like he's worried about the dogs or Shadow Throne. So maybe the maybe the rope is a real contender, but. Without his help, no. He did say that, and I think that, I mean, even though he speaks with power, I just think he speaks with confidence, and essentially he speaks with an absolute fearlessness of death. I, I agree with you. He, he says a couple of times, he says, I fight my own battles. I, I took that to mean that he does not need help, he does not want help, and he does not want anybody to benefit from what he's doing. And he doesn't want people interfering with what he's doing also. Definitely not. Like he doesn't. <laughs> don't get, get on that other board. side. And even if your ends help me, I don't care for you to do it. Don't need your help. Just like Dujek. Well, I was thinking about something else when you're. When I was psychoanalyzing Animator Rake here. It's like he may be an ascendant and have all this power, but 
in his actions, he still acts like a mortal. He doesn't manipulate. He doesn't play all these games. He is very straightforward, and he solves things very physically, not metaphysically or by by moving chess pieces around. He's just very direct and physical on the, on the planet. Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't know. He views this as his game board. I think the other gods view the world as his game board, but he wants to say, this is not my game board. I want to be one of the pieces. Uh, he wants to solve these problems himself, not manipulate others to solve it for him. So he's micromanaging? No, he's not micromanaging. No, he's, not. he's taking he, it all on himself, right? Yeah, exactly, Yule. Exactly. So he has shouldered the burden of fighting the Malazan Empire with the help of another ascendant or two, I guess, because Kalor and Kaladan Brood are both ascendants. Sure. Um, but that's the fight that he's talking about in Darugistan. He doesn't need anybody's help. He wants them off the field. They just complicate things. And he would rather have the Empress on the throne than somebody from Shadow. Mm -hmm. Right. But all of his tactics and strategies are physical strategies. They're not metaphysical with like hiding in somebody else's body or yes. manipulating somebody's opinion or right. whatever, whatever the case may be. Just he's bending it to his will. Physically. Well, he is the most powerful creature I think we've encountered, right? Have we encountered anything more powerful than this guy? Well, it depends. Are we talking like Imos or, you know, Jaghut or... Well, we've only met one Imos, and we don't really know how powerful he is. Right, I'm just and saying, Animander... you know, these are things that we don't know the limits of their potential sometimes. You're right, you're right. But we haven't even seen a Jaghut yet. I mean... These hounds are tough enough. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you now you get Animator Rake, Caladan Brood. All right, where are we? So we're going to talk about uh, Rake talking about Opon also. Yeah, we had just finished talking about Rake talking with Perrin and his mm -hmm. Shadow Throne. And he's like, be gone. Did you notice how that happened? It was Shadow Throne saying, fine, the field is yours, you deal with Opon. And that was when Rake found out that Opon was on the board. Mm -hmm. I think that's important because, as you recall, Brood told Crone to keep Rake in the dark about almost everything. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is him finding out that Opon is on the board. Right, and so to that point, uh, Crone kind of favors Brood as his greater master. She said as much in the in that chapter, which was, I believe, also chapter 10. Pretty sure. Okay, so Shadow Throne departs. Woof. Takes the dogs with him. It's just Perrin left on the, the field of battle. And I think... With Rake. Yeah, with Rake. When does Crone show up? It's after it's right this, after right? this bit where they talk about Opon and Opon's influence on uh -huh. in the battlefield. Rake is wondering how much influence Opon has over Perrin. And he yeah. kind of does like an MRI on him, on Perrin. You're talking about when he puts his hand on his yeah, chest? Yeah, Rake realizes, he's like, yeah, there's no Opon here. There was Opon here, and Opon screwed you up something big time, patching you together after death. And Rake suggests how sorry he is for Perrin for what has happened. And should Caladan Brood actually be around, He'd be able to heal the guy. He'd be able to yeah. heal Perrin. So that's very interesting. Was that a mind blow yeah. for you? It was a mind blow for me. I think that's some incredible insight into Caladan Brood as being a good person. Too honorable to consider an enemy. Yeah. Uh, a healer of extraordinary talent. Yeah. Um, I think you're right, Philip. I think he is an incredibly good guy. There are a couple of things here that it just really impressed me. It's like you've seen such a, a huge conflagration of power. And then Animator Rake says, hey, well, hey, you know, can I approach you? And that's polite. He asked permission, just yeah. like when he went to Baruch's. And he's sheathing his sword when he does it, too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He asked for permission. And do you remember when Crone met Baruch? Yeah. And he says yes. his protocols and politeness and everything. He is Im imbued with honor and dignity or something like that? It's something like that. He, he yeah. Basically, there's he has a rules of what is he considers standard and polite behavior. And he's doing it again to, to a mortal, right, that he just met. And, mm -hmm. and he politely asks him if he can approach. 
and he told him that he was no longer a tool of Opon, to be very clear, but that his sword remained one. Rake says that Opon has hastily withdrawn from Perrin. Yeah. Now, the yeah, question he, Rake is... caught a glimpse. There was a moment earlier in this part, I do believe, where Rake yes. kind of stares at Perrin and is like, I thought I saw something, but it wasn't there. That's not I what know. I saw. <laughs> and that, was that when Opon left the body, is the question? I think okay, so. Cool. Pretty damn, pretty damn near. Okay. Oh yeah, and remember, Opon and Rake hate each other, or at least Rake hates Opon. I don't know. Rake seems to hate Opon. Yeah, I think Opon probably fears Rake, and that's so about Rake the has effectively driven off the hounds in this part of the chapter, driven off Shadow Throne, driven and off the rope. the rope, and drove drove off <laughs> Opon also. Do you see why Damn. it's like his board? I mean, he's powerful enough to clear the board. And he's being respectful of yeah. Perrin. He's like, may right. I approach? And Perrin's like, kind of, he, he takes his cue from Rake, and he's like, oh, why not? <laughs> There's some power in that, even though, because we know Perrin's in a situation where he's like, ah, oh, forget it. I'm out. You know, if it, if it has to be, that's the way it is. That's true, but I don't. That that moment really, really impressed me with Rake. Is that he's got so much unbelievable power, and yet he asked permission. That I mean, that says a lot to me. Well, remember, Brook said that the power had not molded the man; the man had molded the power. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, to me, it seems like he's a good guy, not a black and white good guy, because he's real cavalier about who he's willing to kill and stuff. But Brood also. You know, they seem like they're the good guys in opposition to the Malazans, who we just saw Lauren's assessment of the Malazan plan as being wrong. It's morally wrong. Right. And I mean, that's the beauty of this book. You know, we're watching, it's the Malazan Book of the Fallen, Gardens of the Moon. And we're following the Malazan army. And we are falling in love with characters and maybe some we find despicable, but we still like them like Airlock. <laughs> Uh-huh. And then all of a sudden we meet the people in Jerushistan and there's unlikable council members huh. and people kind of like, like that. them too. Exactly. And again, yeah. we're, you know, we're, we're now looking where Lauren's talking about humans killing humans. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just, you know, that's what we're looking at here. Well, the, the, <laughs> the, the message is in, in any war, you know, the people on the right or the left or the north or the south or however you want to look at it is just like, ultimately, there's good people and bad people, whether regardless of what the cause is, and we shouldn't condemn all of them. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the Malazans are, are sweeping across the country, it seems. and Continent. Yeah, oh, I, I, yeah exactly. That's what I mean. And, you know, it's kind of like a sports team buying up all the talent at it's, you know, eventually you're going to start hating them. <laughs> yeah, the Malazans kind of seem like the bad guys. Sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. The thing is, is that a guy like Caladan Brood and Anna Manta Rake, they live forever. We just had in the Malazan Empire a king die and his uh, servant die, his, his second in, hand, in command die. Oh, and, yes. And, you know, this is a new regime continuing the old stuff. Uh, you know, it's still Malazan Empire wiping, you know, going over the continent, you know, sweeping over. So you can look at an empire as a living being, sort of like a corporation. Like Rome. So maybe the corporation that is the Malazan Empire, it kind of doesn't matter who's at the head. That's, right? Yeah, exactly. It's got a life of its own at, the, at this moment. Well, this is a and, chugging machine that has to keep going or else it's going to feed on itself. Yep. And the only way well, to do it is to feed on take something else. In. Yeah, keep chewing. Is this like the Huns? Do you know that kind of stuff? I don't care about history too okay. much. Period. What? Because what they would do is don't, they would go in me. and they'd, they'd wipe over you know, the, the land that they took over. And, you know, the, only the people that are productive stuck around. <laughs> well, are you willing to are you willing to stick around, stick around with this concept of what we're doing here? All right. Hmm, you you're, worth, stick, you're worthwhile to society. Exactly. Therefore, you can stick around. If you're a beggar, you're probably going to get the sword. But they didn't, like, burn up. Uh, they didn't burn or destroy art or anything like that necessarily. And... You know, mm. they, they subsumed it and learned mm. from their culture that they're taking over. 
So in its own way, you know, they they were kind of like keeping it living. You kind of say that with the Malazans, but they freaking wipe out so much stuff. I mean, no magic, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I th- it was a short lived. Uh, it was a short lived thing. Yeah, that was a short lived. Uh, whatever arcane proclamation, ar- arcane or, purge. Yeah. Right. Well, that's yeah. true. But I mean, they go in, and the first thing they do is they they start calling the nobility, right? Well, yeah, but that you don't lose much by doing one tenth of the nobility, man. Sure, you don't lose uh, much. You know, you're right. You, you are per, you are right there. If you're only getting rid of the, you know, the the five percent, the- you know, the people that run the town, the city, and probably, and as we've seen in Darujah, they Stan, didn't run the town. They're not they're not cool people. Those people, those council people, they're backbiting and they're they're. Our politicians are the same way, exactly. and they don't actually run things. It's their assistants that run everything. Mm-hmm. The system's not at risk. All right, let's get back on track, though. Yes. Hey, small little. I'm just just lore here that I'm saying. So seven hounds attacked Animator Rake and Herlock. However, I have eight on my tally. How's that? I and they're all named. I did not mess that up. They're all named. Okay. There may be more. There may be less. But uh, you said all of them are there. And I think we're, we're... I don't know. I thought there were only seven, though. Well, only because Gear was the seventh town. I think that's our, what our marker was. But seventh may be not the limit. There may be more. I don't think there are, though. No, but whatever. I have eight. Eight named hounds. What are they? Here. They're right here. Okay. Can you still hear me? Uh-huh. Um, blind. Baron. Shan. Doan. Rude, Palak, Gear, and Ganrod. Yep, that's eight. But I don't have that's a, a good observation. I thought there were only, I only seven. See seven I... dude. I'm looking at Hounds of Bl- Hound of Shadows. What are the li- what? Okay, fine. What's the list say? What what your page is it on? Okay, I'll just read it's it on myself. page eighteen. Eighteen. Well, Palak may be dead. It was mentioned in chapter twelve and chapter fifteen. But Palak was... 18. I'm sorry, yeah. Players. <laughs> you read the front of the book now, too. I guess I need to read the front. I've done it so many times I've done times this one now. before, though. I'd be like, I'm lost in a chapter. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to take a break and just look hey, at the which dramatis one's, Which one is not on the list on page Palak, 18, Philip? Or whatever you said. Where is it in the Palak. book? Palak is on chapter 12 and chapter 15. Do you have a page number? I'm not chance? going through a whole chapter. That's fine, but that was called the first mate of Rude. Yeah, okay. As I think implying, that died a while ago. Exactly. It didn't say it, but if it's first mate, that means it has been replaced. Yes. Uh, that implies there was a second mate. Yes. Yes. So maybe Palak is dead. Maybe. Maybe. Don't know. Or in a cave somewhere. Well, not in this book, right? Exactly. Not a dramatic. Not a dramatis persona. 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 Let's put that. All right. So in this conversation that we have strayed far from, Crone has flown overhead and then landed. And if you guys will note somewhere in the book, I didn't really mark it, um, a shadow had passed over yes. before Animanda Rake arrived. And then, like, Perrin went back to thinking about the dogs that were right in front of him. And then Animander Rake arrived. So what, Crone right? was like, hey, Animander Rake, you might have wanted so to show up Crone, here. Yeah, so Crone and Animander Rake are able to communicate instantaneously as well. Sure. Yeah. So anyway, Crone's there. She's landed. She gobbles down one of the eyeballs and then approaches talking. And Perrin's like, what? I'm not even surprised. <laughs> I'm not even surprised. And she informs Rake that the sword is not the only tool of upon that there is another and she knows what it is and they dismiss Perrin and don't talk about it in front of him Perrin wanders off so that was the other thing I wanted to point out though is that now that upon has been revealed by shadow throne crone tells everything that she knows she had been withholding this information at brood's request but now that he knows she fills him in completely right so you had mentioned earlier, Yule, that she prefers Brood. I read that chapter again earlier because it was relevant to what we're talking about right now. And she says as much, that she prefers Brood because he's more 
he compliments her more. That's why. That's the only reason. Um, and he, That's the only reason. And he's more, f- and he's more free with his information. Uh-huh. But um, it was it was after a compliment. He said that she had done well, and she was like, "Yes, well." You're, that's why I prefer you, but it, that doesn't matter. That's that's regardless. She fills Rake in though on Opon, or that's implied to end off this section. Perrin has wandered off in search of his horses, like his and Tox's horses, the surviving horses. I guess they had more than one each. I guess there's a at least one each. So after finding the horses and having a good cry. Perrin returns to the scene of battle, and Animander, Rake, and Crone are gone, but the dog's bodies remain. He approaches one of them, and he's, like, kind of petting it, and he says that it's, like, this magnificent beast, beautiful animal, and he accidentally touches some of the blood, and he recoils, but not fast enough. So after touching the blood, there is the sound of chains snapping taut, and Perrin falls into darkness. So describe this place to me if you can. Yeah, well, Perrin finds himself walking when he comes to, if you will. And he realizes that he's not alone. Around him, all over the place, are people walking along with him. Not all people, other creatures also. Yeah, many not humans. (laughs) Yeah, many not, and they're all shackled. Perrin is not shackled, but everybody else is. And they're shackled to something that's way down far away. And they're hunched over and they're pulling that thing that's way down far away. And it says here, The ground underfoot was barren, lifeless. Overhead, there was nothing but darkness. Beneath, the constant creak, the chains, was a heavier sound than Perrin could feel through the soles of his boots. So that is a massive wagon. Yeah the scale of which is impossible to really imagine. He said that the undercarriage was like seven arm spans wide. The walls of the carriage are like 20 feet high. The wheels are taller than a man. Mm -hmm. It's just immense. And it's being pulled by these thousands and unnumbered people chained to it. Uh, Speaking of unnumbered people, there's a moment where he talks to somebody and I just want to say, that person doesn't have a name anymore. (laughs) You know, that, Perrin's yeah. like, I'm stupid for even, he thinks to himself, I'm stupid for even having wondered what this, you know, this person might even have a name. Right. That's the kind of situation we're in here. He's like people enslaved within, and we find out within Dragnipur. Yeah. And the, the warren, warren inside of the sword. Wow. A sword that has a warren to itself? Yes. Oh, I don't think inside I really understood that until now. It's pretty cool. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. The sword is fantastic. So he's inside the sword, but he hasn't been killed by it, which is why he isn't chained. And he decides after talking to this guy and being helped out, and he was attacked by one of the dogs briefly, and he submitted, so the dog let him go, and it was complicated. But Yeah, he still had the blood of a, of a hound on him, and so it kind of fooled them into believing that it was one of them. That's the explanation of the man who helped him. Yeah, exactly. That he had the conversation with. Um, But he decides that he wants to help the hounds because they're like, they're pulling at it sideways. And this guy lets him know that there was peace here before those hounds arrived and he already misses it. And they're pulling the hound off its tracks or trying to tip it in their attempt to get away. Yeah, Perrin so asks, like, helps. what will happen if it tips over? Do you remember what they say? The pulling will get harder. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, just, I don't know. I like that. It's just like some man resigned to his fate. Uh, I think that's humor, personally. It is and, humor. And somebody who has withheld their – he said he was killed by Rake long ago. A name is meaningless, right? However long ago that was, this big man, as he has described, has a sense of humor still. So I applaud him. I take my hat off. <laughs> this guy's funny. They do not topple the wagon. People fall. Perrin off. says, dogs, I'm going to help you. And they stop. They just start walking along with everybody else. And Perrin starts inspecting the collar, the welds, looking for weak spots. And he goes down the entire length of chain, which is 70 arm spans long. And he finds no weak spots, no cracks, no 
chips, nothing. The chain is sound. But it leads him all the way back to the underside of the wagon. Yeah, you know, it, all right, so if I was going to nitpick anything, this mm. part of the chapter felt like a side quest more than maybe any other thing that we've in, you know encountered in this book. Mm-hmm. It, it's like, all right, we're experiencing Dragnapur. This is cool. There's very interesting stuff. There's fun conversation. But ultimately, it's like, well, you want to free these animals, you know, that you were somewhat instrumental yeah. in having killed, you know, at least a little bit. That, that's the quest. Yes, that's the quest. And it's kind of like, well, I'm going to undo everything that just happened. At least it's theoretically what he's going to try and do. I don't know. It's just, it, it, I mean, I like it. I think this is really good because you get a really good description of what this wagon is like going forward and that kind of stuff. But that side quest aspect to this story doesn't necessarily push the story forward, at least as far as what I could see within this chapter. Within this book? Sure thing. I mean, well, the thing is, is maybe something will play a, a role in this later on, and I don't want to, you know... Don't. Yeah, you know what I mean, not. So, like, I'm going gonna, I'm so, gonna to give a little bit of, you know, leeway here. But if I was, like I said, nitpicking something, this would be the aspect of, or the part of the book I would. Yeah, it seemed it's, it seemed completely out of it seemed really out of place as far as like the building climax, right? The it seems to me like both of you don't think that he has any reason to feel that the hounds were killed because of him. Mm, that's what sounds. No, that's what I, sounds I'm like just saying me. there's. It seems like there's no real reason to come to this place. Well, he touched the blood. Well, okay, I, mm-hmm. I will sum this up at the end. Uh, all of my problems okay. with this chapter. That's that's fine. We'll sum it up at the end. Um, I feel like it makes a lot of sense for him to feel a little bit guilty. Uh, he is the reason that talk came out onto the plane. He is the reason talk is gone, right? He is he somehow blames himself for the death of Tattersail, though I'm not real sure why that would be other than exposure to him caused her to die. And I think now he feels that he's partially to blame for the dogs dying too so he wants to help them out like all and he knows that this is a fate worse than death he can see it right this is in eternal enslavement and you you the description when he meets the dogs and looks into their eyes they're that tall he looks into his eyes at his height and he just sees the defeat in the dog's eyes and he feels for the animal and he's like oh, i've got to help them like all of it made sense to me all of it felt good and right and, you know, I don't remember if it was in this part, but I know it's in this chapter. Perrin starts questioning whether the fa- whether or not Opon actually is having a significant effect on the decisions that he's making, or if he's allowing the uh, the uh, you know the concept that a god is influencing him to do what he's doing. Like he has no free will anymore. Yep. And I feel like coming toward, and this is where I was kind of talking about a little vindication. Uh, because I didn't realize that Opon was so, inf- you know, influencing Perrin's actions so much. This is him not letting himself off the hook, at least. And yes, you know, I think that's accurate. And and, and I I think all of these things are leading to the point where, and that's the only aspect of this side quest that doesn't, you know, that makes me give a hope that it's not, you know, futile. That it's not just some some throwaway part in the chapter. But this is a growing of the character. He is going through all of this negativity and he's finally being able to do something that he thinks is proactive, maybe. You know, something It is this section. It is this yeah. section, and he says, I alone am unchained. So it's it's an absolute metaphor for what has just happened to him. Rake has just freed him completely from Opon's influence. I mean, he's unchained, so he, he and it is here where he decides that he can act for himself, and he does. And the first thing he does is he chooses to help those dogs. Right. I, I mean, I thought it was all very sensible. Mm-hmm. I did, it was not bothered by this section at all. But he can't find a break in the chain. <laughs> no, they're unbroken. They go through the wood of the wagon. Like, they go through like it's an illusion. And they go further under the wagon and then into an area where there's just this, like, floating dark hole and all of the chains go into that floating dark hole and that's 
mm, cold as all can be. He can't even touch the chains anymore. They're too cold. So it's just like radiating cold and dark. Yet he can see. I don't get it, but that's okay. And then he, that's when he pulls out his sword. He can feel it trembling. And he's like, oh, pawn, come, come to me. And the man appears. Yeah, he thinks that because the sword is still touched by Opon, that Perrin can now call Opon to come to him, at least this one time. Yeah, he did. And and I don't know why he thought that, but he did think that, and it did work. Do you remember the end of the section when Sari was still pursuing Krupp and Company? And she said soon the coin would be in her hand, and then maybe a god would die? Mm-hmm. Sounds to me like Sari knows how to do it, knows exactly what to do. But Perrin had to figure it out intuitively. But it sounds like that's the rule. If you've got a pawn's coin or tool in your hand, you can summon them. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Do you remember when Crone and Brood were talking? And one of them said that given the opportunity, Rake would get the coin and kill the twins. Right. And Perrin's upset that the it's the male that shows up and not the woman. <laughs> Why you? I wanted your sister. It's, she likes Perrin more, it sounds like. She treated him harshly. She was responsible for his healing, and she was mean about it. She's just all business. There's no there's no care in the world for him. All right, well, wasn't it her that, like, she talked her brother, I don't know, you know, into healing Perrin, though, using him, right? When You're talking about the conversation that they had at Hood's Gate yeah. when he was like, I don't want anything. It was her idea to use Perrin. She's the one that healed him. All right, she's more invested in Perrin. How's that? Maybe I should say that. And so, likewise, he would think that, you know, if there was any one of them that I can convince to do something for me, it would be her. Okay, so he has summoned Opon. He's dissatisfied with the one that arrived. He wanted the sister, not the brother, but the brother is there, and he physically holds the brother in place despite scratching and biting and kicking and all of these things. Oh, he right. will not let go of Opon. Well, I thought that was weird. Like, you have a god in your hands, and all he can do is, like, kick and bite and scratch like some normal bum on the street. I just... Can't he summon something more amazing than that? I just... I... Do you... Earlier in this section, I believe he said he was going to turn the power of Opon onto itself. So I don't know that Opon could do anything. Like, this is the tool of Opon summoning their once tool. And I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know. He's not powerful in this moment, but like... He's being held, right? The will is being is held. Well, and then that's where the hounds come into play. They're starting to come towards him because they're like down with taking out Opon. It was this beautiful moment in writing where two of the chains went slack. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that is such a nice way of telling us that the dogs have stopped going forward. You know, their attention has gone backwards and they're like, they're coming. <laughs> the dogs are coming. I don't know why they would want to kill Opon. Well, it's be- Is it because they're tool ki- wounded gear? I mean, I think that's definitely a reason to not like somebody. <laughs> they they turned around right quick though. They were like, "Yes, we're coming. We're gonna kill this thing that you've well, summoned." Well, and then he uses them for bait. If Perrin is trying to free them. Yes, and you know this is something that I don't. I don't know. They, no, they can't I don't sense think. I don't think he's on. communicating with them on that mm-hmm. level. I think that they know that he's trying to help them. But it was when Opon arrived. Perrin didn't say, "Hey, jump through this hole and you guys will be fine." He had to use Opon as bait, and it was Opon's idea to use him as bait to lure the dogs through there because maybe if they jump through, the chains will disappear. That was Opon's idea. That was Opon's solution to the problem. Right. He wanted to be let go. Because Opon had no way of breaking the chains. And couldn't break free from Perrin. Huh. He was chained in that moment by Perrin, right? So it's like, it's a will thing, I think. Uh, it's it's all very allegorical and metaphorical. Well, I mean, and if I, you can, well, I mean, we're in a non we're world. In a, yes. Or, I mean, it we're is, a but it isn't. Um, we're in, it, you know, it has its own ru- rules that we don't know necessarily. But, but those dogs are coming. And they want they want Opon for some weird reason. They want Opon. Right. They convince each other, basically, him and Opon, for Perrin to hold him in front of the portal so that the hounds will chase Opon and they're gonna do the whole I'm gonna move my hand and you're gonna 
hit the wall kind it's, of thing. It's exactly like a bullfighter holding up a, a red cape. That's exactly right? what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, bullfighter, lead, red cape. Lead the dogs straight through the warren. Solves all the problems. A, a pawn gets to go on his own. But pawn's like, hey, you are going to let me go, right? <laughs> and he does. Yeah. He does. Of course. Perrin's pretty classy. The hounds jump. Perrin releases a pawn who disappears. Perrin falls to the ground. The hounds go through. They disappear. Uh, Perrin wakes up on his hands and knees back on the rivy plain, and the dog's bodies are gone. Did it work? don't know i mean these were dead something, animals right so is he something happened their soul so they don't spend eternity chained to dragnapur hmm. and but they're still dead i mean that's still a bonus you know you get a boon for that i think why would their bodies disappear if he freed their souls uh symbolic again i don't know maybe that's nah, what happens to a know, hound man. when they die Oh, that's a good point. Like anim- um, like the Tisty Andy, sure. uh, you know, with the spell that makes them disappear or whatever. Maybe. Did you guys notice that Opon referred to Dragnapur as a god-slaying sword? Yeah. And that it had killed dragons? I know, right? It's like nothing is immune to it. Nothing. Okay, so the final section of this chapter begins with that destroyed party of Krupp and company with Crocus helping Cole bind his wounds. And I mean, <laughs> they got just so handed. It's hilarious, but there appears behind them, the Fisher girl. And I chose my words. You sure did. Carefully. Fisher girl too. Yeah. 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 Great minds. So she looks out of place. Crocus seeing her is like stumbling trips over a rock pulls out his daggers gets back up and he's like she's a killer and cole's like that girl is not a threat and he's like huh you're right her confidence is all gone like she does she just looks scared and like alone on the on the plane and he's like oh hey do you understand me and she's like yeah i I, you're not speaking malazam but i do and cole puts it all together really quick I have to give him credit. He's like, this girl has been possessed and we need to get her to your uncle Mamet as soon as possible. He didn't miss a drop when he said that girl has been possessed. So no, he picked it up really quick. You're right. So, You're right, and he yes, did. he is actually sober now, which is the only yes. distinguishing difference. This whole encounter, he leaped forward when everybody else is getting blown away. He knew exactly what was going on. He's taken charge and being the leader. I mean, this guy is not, a, he has unfortunately been a slovenly drunk the entire time we've known him, but it's now it's like you're seeing the real Cole. Well, who who appears to be an incapable fighter and a bad horseman, but he's smart. Cole has his moment here, and we're seeing a completely different side, and I kind of like it. He seems to be coherent and wise and educated and capable. Well, he tells Crocus the reason to get her because Crocus is like, you haven't told me why. I don't want to do this thing that you're telling me to do because you haven't told me why. And he says that all of the information that she can't remember is in her head and it may be vital. So get her back to Darugistan. Lay out some food for me because I won't be able to move for a while. These guys are knocked out. uh, yeah, I'll wait for him here. Oh, and did you catch that thing? She's like, well, what if what if the uh, mercenary returns? And he's like, what if she does? Whew. He was basically telling Crocus that you can't take her, buddy. You're not a, you're not enough to stand in the way of her if she does return. So go ahead and get out of here because we're dead either way if she comes back. So he uh, packs up. That's the end of this chapter. That's the end. Yeah, Crocus takes the Fisher girl to his uncle Mammoth. We're just going to finish up, I think, with a little yeah. bit of... Yeah, we're just closing it down. I don't really have anything. Everything that I have is as my notes <sighs> for the end, we've already included. So I don't really have anything to add. Okay. I, I would like to say that this chapter was very, very exciting. I read the 16 pages in no time flat, three times. Like, bam, mm. bam, bam. But I didn't have to really take any notes. I didn't find it to be really unplumbable. I thought it made a lot of sense. It was a lot of action. It was a lot of fun. Not too deep. Well, we talked about that earlier, and I, it's interesting that I had a completely like uh, antipodal interpretation of this chapter because 
this is might have been one of my this might be my least favorite chapter to date and i know there's some excitement going on there but it just it just seems so it did make sense to me it it, it we have been building up to this uh, climax for for a while you this is not the climax well okay that's oh. this is not did the climax did you want to see crocus die by sari's hand is that what you're telling me no, that's one element of it. I mean, there was Sari pursuing Crocus. There was Perrin pursuing Lorne. There... Do you realize how badass that... Okay, there is one other thing I want to talk about. But do you realize how badass that was? On complete accident, Anamander Rake saved Crocus's life. And yet, it's not accident. Why did he show up? That makes no sense to me. Hold on. There's a lot going on here. There's, there's a lot going on here. We have Anamander Rake who just wants to clear the board. Right? He wants to get people off of the board. He's like, you're interfering, you're interfering, get out of here. So he gets rid of Shadow Throne in the rope. He's like, get out of here, I don't want you around. He thereby accidentally saves the coin bearer. Right? He didn't know he was saving the coin bearer. It just happened. It just happened. It was a complete accident. There is no, there is no reason for that to be like, oh, this is why, this is the thing behind it. That's, that's just, it's just the way things go. Okay, so, right? so, uh, back to my spiel here. Like I said, you had Perrin pursuing Lorne, you had Herlock pursuing Perrin, you had Krupp pursuing Lorne, you had Sorry pursuing, uh, Crocus, and then you had Lorne and Tool on their mission to release this jagged tyrant, and it was building up towards his head. And it all was supposed to come together, and it just kind of fizzled. This is not the climax. I will reiterate. This is a middle chapter yes. in a book. Yeah, they, they call that a pseudo climax or anticlimax, a literary term. Whatever. I don't know what it's called. Whatever. I mean, I just, I just have I have example after example after example of why this this chapter just didn't make any sense in the continuity of the story. To you. To me. And it is fine. I am sure there are like, a lot of other people who read this chapter and felt the same way, but well, I didn't have a problem with well, it, and I'm sure there are a lot of people well, that didn't. Well, please, just hear me out. I'm hearing you out. We're having a conversation, aren't we? It's a two-way thing where we talk to each other. Yeah, okay, and you will have a chance to re- rebuttal. So Please continue. Oh, thank you for allowing me. Oh, yeah, thank you, absolutely. Thank you for allowing me to continue. Yes, please do. I mean, there was Lorne and Krupp and company... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Lauren versus the Krupp and the whole thing. Like, that just... They weren't supposed to have an engagement. As we recall, uh, they were told to stay out of sight and protect the coin bearer. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that was the plan, but... But the plan, all, all plans are destroyed by Opon. The plan did not go to plan. Okay. Right? I mean, were the twins in, in effect there? I mean, were they... How were they... I'm not sure. I'm how much sure. influence did they have? I mean, how much... Because it, as a young god, I mean, how could they influence anybody? What? They're gods. They, well, you know that they have an influence over the coin bearer. You know they've had an influence over people associated with the coin bearer. So that's a silly question. All right. I, okay. All right, all, right, all right. So I'm just saying, when when they interacted, I mean, Lord just like flew into a rage and attacked them for like no reason whatsoever. I agree. That was a very strange thing coming from somebody who then afterwards, after watching the mess fall out, says that she didn't know why she did that. She doesn't like to spill blood. Yeah. And who in the previous chapter had said that she had been behaving weirdly because Opon was involved. Made no sense. Made no sense. I mean, it makes sense if you think that maybe there's precedent there and Opon was involved. All right. Next point. So... Uh, the ambush by Herlock onto Perrin and Tuck. I mean, like, why then? It just didn't make any sense. And why even... Per- wait, wait. What do you mean, why then? Why them or why, why then? Why then? Herlock could have theoretically attacked yeah. at any time, any time, right? I suppose so, yeah. I mean, he's moving around inside of his warren... But he was he was ready. He was waiting for them to reach a certain point, or for I don't know. But, but why does that matter? He waited for them to be, you know. Perrin was about to say something to talk. He was like looking over his shoulder, and then bam, this whole thing opens up, and the horses, you know, crumpled. Uh, yeah, it's just I don't. I, I just he he was ambushing them. I don't comprehend why this this animosity towards Perrin. It just doesn't make any sense to me. 
Um, and then Quickman says, Perrin, why? He doesn't even know who he is. It's a, he knows who Perrin is. Well, see, technically, he knows who he is. But it, other than some guy who showed up in the middle of nowhere and decided to take over the company. Was murdered, but not murdered. And probably by Sari, who's a player on the board. And why is she taking players off the board? They didn't really know. Like, he, he obviously had more importance than just some guy from Unta who was coming to take over. Don't you think it's crazy that he just happened to be, like, watching, like, at that moment right then? Hairlock? No, I'm sorry. Quickbin. Quickbin. He was just watching at that moment, waiting. Why? I just... It's, it's just... He had been he had been watching since the beginning of the chapter. Mm-hmm. He'd been watching Hairlock. Right, and we don't know when he set up the the sticks with the twine, but he's been watching Hairlock, so he watched the whole thing happen, but wasn't able to save Talk. Right, he wasn't able to intervene fast enough to save Talk. Yeah. But and he's not motivated to save Talk either. He doesn't know who Talk is. He only wanted to save Perrin because he wants to ask him questions. Mm. He was really just there to end Hairlock. That was his goal. All right, fine. So this stuff goes down, and then the hounds attack. The hounds get there, but then Anna Manta Rake shows up. The- yes, because Crone had fl- was flying over presently. She was flying over and watching the whole thing, and then the hounds of shadow showed up on this field, and she's like, "They're here." And Anna Manta Rake's like, "No, they're not." Okay, all right, fine. I get that one actually. I do get that one. But um, sorry, was about to go Crocus and then gets called back by Shadow Throne. No, Shadow Throne recalled the rope, which means that he ended the possession permanently. Yes, exactly. I... It was it was a demand of Animander Rake. Get off the field. You are not a player on this game, and that's one of the byproducts. It wasn't purposeful. He didn't save Crocus on purpose. It's just a byproduct. And then the dust is settling, and every, all the ascendants leave, and then Parrot is sitting there, and then he goes up to this hound, and he's like, oh, you're such a beautiful animal. I I just, I don't get that. It makes no sense. You, you remember he liked horses, too. And they, or they probably are. He's a dog guy, man. I mean, why is that so hard of a stretch? He likes animals. I don't know. He's, he's very kind to the horses, as you might recall. And then he goes up and he pets his dead dog. It's just, I don't get it. And he touches the blood and that acts as a means to access the warren. Yeah, deus ex machina. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's just some segue. Yule, did you have a problem with this stuff? Like, are you are you having the same kinds of problems that Philip's well, having? Well, no, because I know to expect this um, to happen. So maybe it doesn't... I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just, like, willing to accept it. I mean, yeah, touching okay. the blood. But the thing is, is, like, you're not just touching the blood of a creature... You're touching a blood of a creature that got taken into, you know, Dragnipper. And, you know, there's like a lingering magic that's still on the body. And so he was was able to... flowing, too. Yeah, exactly. So he was able to get in there is uh, basically what happened. You know, there you go. Okay, so do you have more for Uh, it? Keep going. Yeah, I have have more, yes. Keep going. Keep going. And so then he gets there, and then the hounds find out he's there, and they attack, and they get his jaws around his throat. But whatever reason, they just, like, let him live. And that guy explained that to my liking. The guy that helped him up oh. said that they, they smelled their own blood on you and took you for a hound, but... These near-godlike beings are fooled by something so simple? That doesn't make any sense. Maybe they're not that bright, you know, they like work like animals kind of. That, that's how I read that was I think they were aware that Perrin was not a dog, but they smelled their own kin on him. But they knew him by sight. And they did know him by sight, but like they I mean dogs are very scent oriented animals. Is that helpful? They know you by your smell. They don't know you by your, their sight. Like, have you ever? There's a video that I watched recently where this guy who lost a lot of weight. He was like very heavy dude. He lost a lot of weight, so the dog looks at him and doesn't recognize him, but then smelled him and was like, "Oh my God, you're my master." No, I I, right? I, I agree with with those connections and so on and so forth. But I mean, from the beginning, it's I mean, these dogs actually communicate. As Shadowthone. They were communicating verbally with Shadowthone. They were communicating verbally 
with what did they with say? Anna Manarik. No, you didn't. What did they didn't say? Hear their words, but well, you can infer but, it but, though but, from the response. But Rake said, "Oh, Gear Gear wants you Gear dead. Wants to kill you." Yeah, which doesn't mean that they said, "I want to kill that man." He could have just felt that that's what the dog wanted, right? Um, what about the what about the one with uh, Shadow Throne? He said that Quick Ben knew all their names. Yes. That's a more that's a much more difficult concept to feel, right? He's familiar with us, knows our names. That's a weird one. I don't I mean I don't know because oh, uh, we didn't see the conversation. Exactly. And so that my and that's when Shadowthrone said, My hounds tell me that you knew all of their names. Mm-hmm. So clearly they are speaking to Shadowthrone. In a word in a language that he can understand. Exactly. Right. So they're not dumb animals. They can communicate well. I don't think they're as smart as people. I, I don't think we should assume they're dumb as animals. Okay. What else? Like, as soon as Opon showed up on the scene, the hounds wanted them. Oh, yeah. I didn't get that either. Yeah, we talked about that. I, I just I have to assume that it's got something to do with they were the hand that made the sword or, you know, enchanted the sword that wounded one of them. I don't know. They're at odds with Shadow, as in they were opposed to Shadow. You remember when Tattersail opposed Gear's will? Gear wanted, she busted through the wall and wanted that box that Hairlock was hiding in. And Tattersail opposed the will of Gear, and Gear recognized her as an enemy and attacked her. Hmm. I didn't. It might. It might not be anything more than just opposing their will. Hmm. Interesting. It's like Opon definitely was opposing Shadow, openly. Well, no, not openly. <laughs> From hiding. All right. My last thing is that um, okay. the plan that I don't comprehend that was diving into the cold void where all the chains connect well, might yes. be an answer. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems like all of this is. I agree with that one completely. Enormous leaps of. I, I, I'm going to create something to make this other thing plausible and so on and so forth. They seem like yep. made up. Like, I don't know. And it was. But notice also that that was Opon's idea. Perrin wanted to break the chains, and that is what he demanded. He's like, break these chains. And he's like, I, I can't. I cannot. I can't do that. He's like, well, figure it out. And he's like, well, maybe if they dive into the warren from which their bondage originates, maybe the bondage will disappear. Maybe. No promises. Right? And Perrin's like, okay, I'll go with it. Doesn't sound good. Well, I mean, anything's better than what is going on there, right? Well, that's what... Eternal enslavement pulling that giant wagon. Sure. Good lights, man. No. But it was Opon's idea, and Perrin went with it. So I I don't know, like... Obviously, Perrin is not an actor like Anamander Rake does not understand what's going on. Right. So I, I I've detailed why I did the things I had wrong with this chapter. I mean, could mm-hmm. you, could could you detail why you like the chapter? Well, it didn't bother me the way that it's bothering you. It was exciting. It was action packed. You got to see Lorne in action, dude. She wiped out an entire party single handedly, as you pointed out. Although Krupp kind of did it to himself. Whatever. She has that awesome sword. We got to see auditorial. Like in action, we saw what happened. The sp- like, it 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 radiated with cold. It, like breathed in the magic and then radiated it back out cold. That's amazing. That's like a chemical reaction going on. That's so cool. Anyway, th- I mean to me that was that was very very awesome. Um, I like Lauren already, so seeing her in action was really really nice. Nobody died. Like we didn't lose any of the people. They just had this threat um we're still on hold with opening the barrow which i think is appropriate um we got to see anamander rake in action like in action we've never seen him use that sword until now well i I don't know if it was the unveiling of the sword or the use of it on a on a living being but that causes damage to people perrin was bleeding out of his ears and his eyes that's amazing that's a concussion at the very least right had nothing to do with Hairlock. It staggered. It staggered the other hounds, right? 
but it gave him a concussion, a bad one. That's amazing. We saw so many things in this chapter that we have never seen before and wanted to see. I have anyway. That's why I like it. And I have explanations because Erickson has given me evidence to support a lot of the stuff that you didn't have problems with or that you did have problems with. He's given us precedent for some of that stuff or at least made me, you know what it's called? What's it called when you have um, a reasonable doubt, right? I have a reasonable doubt. Like it seems like, okay, maybe I don't know how this works, but I I can expect that I don't know how most of this stuff is going to work and I'll never figure it out. So like the blood, for example, drawing Perrin into the Warren. I don't know why that did that thing, but it seemed like Dragnapur did it, you know, because there was the sound of the chains pulling taut. I don't know, man. He touched the blood of a creature that was enslaved by Dragnapur. I don't know. But, meh. He just went into another Warren. It didn't end the story. It didn't, didn't do much, really, for this book. Right? The dogs just disappeared. So, I don't know. I wasn't bothered by the same things that you were bothered by. Um, except, I mean, I understand what you're talking about at the end when... Um, what was the last one you were talking about? The, I'm sorry. How was diving to the void an answer? Yeah. The, I mean, I, I didn't understand it. It didn't make any sense to me. But, like, it's not... It was Opon. It wasn't Perrin, right? If Perrin had come up with the solution on his own... And said, this is how things go. I'd be like, where is he getting his information? Well, it's like, and how can you summon a god and throttle him with your bare hands and make him submit to you? I mean, this, nothing about this made sense to me. He's holding on to the tool of Opon, which is a weakness of theirs, as has been pointed out in the past. Like, the coin is a way to get to the god. So, therefore, it's a tool... Therefore, the sword is the same. Well, the, we were just told that the t- sword is still a tool, which means, and he was holding it, okay, which means that it has, uh, it provides him with some power against the, them. Then why would a god create a sword, not create, in, imbue himself with a sword or create a coin to make himself vulnerable? That makes no sense. They're gamblers. They're gamblers. They're the deities of chance, man. Yeah, it's just how they do. I mean, it it doesn't make sense for to somebody who wants to control every aspect of everything, you know, but they obviously don't feel the same way that you do, mm-hmm. right? They don't need to have that ultimate control. I mean, I can totally buy that coming from the gods of chance. Tattersail was forced to take this huge gamble to survive, right? Hairlock too. Didn't bother me. But it's okay if it bothered you. Like I already said, uh, there are other people that are going to have the same problems that you had. It's just the way it goes. You didn't like the chapter, though, huh? Well, that's good. We need, uh, it, we need it, to have... Uh... That's right. You have to have... you. We, this is a discussion. We have to have a contrary opinion every now and then. But, yeah, this is... love it all. It, it was at this chapter where I, I thought Erickson's logical storyline fell apart. I just... It was at this chapter that that happened for me. But that's all right. All right, so next chapter in two weeks' time, it is chapter 16, the last chapter in book five. I suspect a lot of the climax that you were expecting is going to come in that chapter, Philip, and I'm pretty sure you're going to read it tonight, so you'll have your answers to a lot of stuff. You know my habits, because, like, literally, like, one of the worst parts about doing this over, like, such a long period of time is that... As soon as we finish these podcasts, I, I read the next chapter because I can't wait to see what happens. Why don't you just read the book? I don't want to have to, like, suppress my knowledge. I, I want to, yeah, yeah, there you go. I want to be real. But you you have read this book before. You just don't Point remember is, it. Point is, I have a very bad memory, and it's like reading it for the first time. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, you called me on it, and you're right. I need to do something about my memory. I think it's probably sleep, man, but um, we're all sleep deprived because we put a lot of hours into making this podcast, and I, for one, think that we're done here for today, don't you? Yeah, we're good. Good episode. All right, gentlemen, thank you for joining me. That's for you two listening as well. Thank you for joining us in this episode. We're going to get to reading and making notes and et cetera, and we'll see you guys in two weeks' time. Bye. Bye, all.